Okay. Well, here's your question. If there's a fire, my best option for survival will be driving away at the first sign of smoke, standing in the middle of an empty area like an oval or a field, sheltering in the bathroom, sheltering in the living room, getting into a pool or a water tank. Driving away as soon as you see smoke. All right. Yeah, I mean, this is the big one, really. This one is the, it brings up that sort of big issue of, you know, stay or flee. Kevin, you go first. Well, yeah, I guess to talk around the issue a little bit, I think we've got to appreciate that there are uh, three major sources of energy to go into fire. The fuel is one of them, and we have a lot of emphasis on the fuel because it's uh, something we can manage. But the other is the energy coming from the weather itself, so the strength of the wind, the dryness of the wind and the, the temperature. There's actually energy in that, so you don't actually need much fuel to have a fire that's be lethal, if you like. And the third one is the topography. So I guess what we're looking at here is, uh, in making some of these decisions, we need to understand how each of those factors are, are playing out here. Standing in the middle of an oval, for example, when if the wind is uh, 60 kilometres an hour and it's 45 degrees, and and all those sorts of things, you still may be in a dangerous location. On the other side of it, you've got moisture and the atmospheric stability that affect fire behaviour. And on Black Saturday, we had no, basically no moisture because of the, the uh, 13 years of drought that we'd had, and we had incredible instability in the atmosphere, which just allows a convection column to form. So fire behaviour is not just all about fuel. There are at least four other major factors and in making the decision then about what you're going to do in terms of your response will depend on how each of those are going to affect you, where your house is, where you happen to be uh, at that particular time. Okay, Justin, what are your thoughts? Gee, it, was, it was really a choice between sort of the, the lesser of five evils here, I think. In that, <laughs> there, were, there were implicit uh, contextual issues about why each of those things wasn't a particularly good idea under certain circumstances. Driving away at the first sign of smoke immediately struck me as, um, well, once you, once you can see smoke, um, more often than not, it's already too late to make a decision about, um, about moving to a, a safer place. Um, and <coughs> unless you're extremely aware of where the fire is um, and where your exit routes are and that that exit route is absolutely clear and you know the rate that the fire is spreading and a whole lot of things which in reality you you certainly don't have. It must you also usually be not mobilise with that amount of information. A bit of an issue that if everyone in the town leaves when they see smoke, you're going to have a few traffic jams. That, that's true as well. So it, it's, it's, it seemed like a bit of a trap question for me. <laughs> Um, middle of the field, um, I, I wouldn't be standing anywhere. I'd be inside a, a car before I'd be out in the open and I'd be inside a house before I'd be in a car or, or out in the open, so there was no way I'd be in a field. Um, sheltering inside a bathroom, bathrooms always have one door. Um, it's where a lot of people do find themselves trapped in a structural fire and um, in, in the statistics of people that lose their lives in houses they often are in a bathroom and often are in fact in the bath. So they're, they're showing that they don't have a sense of the time frame of a fire passing a structure. Um, they're not um, allowing themselves to uh, continually monitor the fire behaviour um, through the windows of the house to um, recognise a point where they um, gain an opportunity to move onto burnt ground once the fire front passes if and when the house succumbs to fire. Um, so uh, th that would, that's something I would have shied away from completely. Um, I guess the, the lesser of the five evils was uh, the living room. It has windows, it has often more than one door. And in fact, I'd be roaming around the house um, uh, constantly monitoring if some windows were broken if, if things were succumbing, um, what's happening outside the house, etc. Um, water tanks and, and pools, all, all that automatically says where well, you're out in the open again. Um, there are some clever techniques about surviving in those circumstances, but um, 
uh, a hierarchy of risk would see me in a house or a, a, a more solid structure any day. Drew? I think it was H.L. Mencken who famously said, for every complex problem there's a simple solution and it's usually wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always <laughs> wrong. <laughs> And, and I think this is, is this is actually a nuanced discussion, and, and I think there is a tendency for people to want simplistic answers as to stick to simple ones, and, and I think that's going to be part of the community education process and sitting down and saying, okay, let's look at your house, let's look at the situations, and having a set of plans based on a range of scenarios. What we do know from the education literature around this is that people are actually able to consider multiple scenarios and have plan A, plan B, and even plan C and plan D for situation A, B, C and D and be pretty good at deciding which of those it is. But it does mean that you have to have that dialogue and narrative and that actually sometimes requires experts to acknowledge that they aren't. What, what's, uh, what's wrong with the idea that uh, <coughs> my plan is as soon as I hear it's going to be a really hot day with a big north wind and the temperatures are rising, I'm going to head out of there. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and a good insurance but, policy. But do you think, I'm guessing you kind of don't think that should be kind of what everyone should do. Everyone should make their own decision in a way. But should we have a, a basically that be the prevailing advice is to get out of there? I don't think it's a one size fits all solution. And I think that way great danger lies. And I know the attraction of simplistic solutions to policy makers and educationalists and all of that. But I think it's a wicked problem. And I don't think we're going to find those simple solutions. Despite the appeal and despite the codependency between state and community about pretending that such reassurance can be provided. What do you think, Kevin? Well, I think one of the interesting things that came out of the Bushfire Royal Commission was that the council assisting the, the commission was very strong on the idea that you should evacuate if there's a, a fire in your area. However, the commission themselves, the three commissioners, basically decided, no, look, that's the one size fits all. It's yeah. not going to work. So whilst there was a significant failure of the existing policy, it, it actually needs to be uh, reinforced and supported yeah. rather than necessarily thrown out and something different and equally bad sort of put into place. So I think the Royal Commission, given all the evidence they, they received from both experts and from people living in those fire prone environments and all the, the time they spent thinking about this, I think came up with quite a wise decision, which is in line with what Drew's basically yeah. saying. It's got to be forces for courses. It's got to be what's appropriate for you in your location at that time in that situation. Mm. And we often don't scale the problems. That is, while it is good, what's called the fallacy of composition, that is, it may be good for me to depart rapidly and head out of the scene, but if 100,000 people do that, we just cook everyone in cars on the road. So th there are these scaling issues about what happens at the individual level, and if we scale that up to the community level, it may not work at all. And I don't think there's a sufficiently detailed discussion sometimes of what would happen if everybody did one of those things and what would be the consequences and I'm not saying I know the answer I'm just saying is we need to think very carefully about these because they're complex okay well look um, you guys will get your chance to answer you ask your questions very soon before that we've got a couple more questions for you I will have sufficient time to leave once I see smoke and or flames well you've got a, you've had a few clues on this one <laughs> Be interesting to see what the answers are Who's been listening? Just the new win. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and uh, we have one more, I think. If I plan to leave early, I don't need preparation for staying and defending. Pretty wise bunch here, in a yeah, way. I think, yeah, <laughs> I think uh, yeah, very much so. And I think one of the things Drew was saying before is plan A, B, and C. Often people think, well, the best thing for me will be to do that, and if that doesn't work, I'll do something, you know, plan B. But in fact, you actually need an equal, uh, a number of options which are equally viable in different circumstances. People often lock themselves into one idea that I'm going to leave, I'm going to stay, 
uh, and the chances are uh, things won't turn out quite the way you expect. So um, I think you know the, the, that's showing up in the result here that people actually sort of uh, understand that. Justin, you got a final word you want to say? No, oh, I think the answers speak for themselves. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's a it's nice to hear. And if it, if it was a, a broad spread, I guess I'd have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> You've all done very well. It's good to see. And Drew? No. Nothing, nothing final to say. All right, well, look, this is the time where you guys get to quiz them. So uh, I think we'll um, give a couple of moments maybe to get some microphones into the audience there. Got one upstairs. Uh, we, got, we got a question upstairs, have we? Got one here? Okay, yeah. Um, well, I've got two. If I can put them and then... Yeah. The, the Maybe one at a time would be good. Yeah, I'll do one at a yeah. time. The, the first thing that um, I feel coming out of all this discussion, <clears throat> I guess there's two things. One is the householder is responsible for the fire going through their property. So the idea that you can just leave is... I mean, it's not, illegal, it's not legal anyway have to do something to prevent fire on your property. But the two questions that I have are, one, we're increasing the population in Australia at a time <clears throat> when the climate is becoming more inhospitable and we're going to push more and more people out into suburbs in the bush, in contact with forest. Now, there's an issue there about A, planning and B, making sure that before you sell someone a house out in the bush, they know what they're going into. And I would have thought that that was all part of this, not education or whatever. It needs to go beyond that. OK, so, so is your question maybe a bit of legislation kind of thing, that we're developing new properties out in the suburbs where people are living and um, we've got to take fire risk into account, I guess? I was going to say, that was one of the primary recommendations of the Bushfire Royal Commission, which was to say this needs to be part of the land titles bit on the property, you know, where you get all the risks, like there's a there's a statement that says this is the bushfire risk, this is what you're taking on, so it's an informed consent model, so people know what they're buying into. I think the devil's going to be in the detail of that, and can you rent a consultant who will come to a different conclusion, and there's going to be a whole bunch of economic issues and factors that we'll have to deal with over legitimacy and validity and reliability, etc., etc. But that was one of the recommendations. And I think, I think you're right in identifying that. And I think so did the Commission. OK, your first question was about uh, responsibility for your own property. Did, did anyone want to answer that one? Well, I'm not familiar enough with the, the uh, legislation in New South Wales, uh, in South Australia, um, <laughs> some foreign land. Um, <laughs> not Victoria, but, anyway. Yeah. But in Victoria, I guess there's a, a difference between whether or not a fire starts on your property and the responsibility you have there, and whether or not a fire is actually passing through your property, in which case you wouldn't ha necessarily have that responsibility. So if the fire started outside your property in Victoria, uh, then you, you don't have any legislative responsibility to stop it passing through your property. But in, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the situation is in, in South Australia here. Is that similar to what? <laughs> yeah, we'll get a microphone to you. Hold on one second. Uh, th there are responsibilities, legal responsibilities for preventing the spread of fire through your land, not actually stopping the fire. So it's not about firefighting, it's about doing the preventative work to um, protect your property and surroundings. It's illegal to tip petrol all over your property <laughs> as a fire is approaching. Do we have a question upstairs? Very back row. Yeah, um, my question relates to, I guess it's following on from the, um, the issue of prevention, uh, fire prevention. But what I take away from me from today, today's presentation is that uh, the issue is very complex and there are a lot of factors that need to be considered in relation to fire safety. But one of the things that I think is common to, um, to all of us is the, the prevention measures. And I think that there are some practical things that can be done to encourage um, clean up operations. One of those would be to um, uh, assist people to, to clean things up. At the moment, we've got uh, deadlines that um, govern uh, when you can burn, burn off on your property. 
Um, and up until that deadline, people are encouraged to do that. But once we're within the, uh, the, the fire zone and you can't burn off, then it, it does become more difficult to, to clear your property. There are a lot of incentives that local councils and other government authorities could actually make to uh, assist people to, to, to clean their property by way of dispose of things to um, uh, local dumps or encouraging uh, um, curbside, curbside collection or other ways of uh, disposing of waste and other uh, fuels around, around properties. Who would like to address that one? I'm just going to say that these are always cost benefit analysis issues. That is, it's easy to solve a problem by throwing money at it. The question is, is what bang for your buck are you getting and what's the cost for the risk reduction versus the risk reduction that you're getting? And I think in many cases communities don't in encourage the kind of initiatives you're talking about because the opportunity cost of devoting the money to that particular area means it has to be taken away from somewhere else or we have to increase services and charges. So I think it's, again, it's an ultimately a very difficult political question. I don't think we live in an era where throw money at the problem is a viable strategy anymore. There are limited resources and we have to think of much smarter and cleverer ways. I think how do we create programs that create incentives at the behavioural level for people to want to clean up their properties or to start earlier so they don't wait till after the fire stuff done. So I think we have to think about how do we invest the resources, not just go to the just pay for it model. So I, I think it's, it's a really difficult issue because as soon as you spend the money on that, the aged care facility down the road or the disabled people or so somebody else will say that money would be better spent on risk reduction with our group rather than your group. But if, if you've, you've reduced the fuel, then that, that has already um, had an effect on uh, eliminating the risk, surely. I understand that, but I, I'm trying to get, if you think about it from a risk perspective, the chances of the fire coming through that individual's property at the micro level are very low. So the cost of doing that to everybody and all the time, sometimes the cost to the community to that, can actually outweigh the costs of having the fire. So it, there are very complex decisions that have to be made here. And most people don't think about risk in that way. It's just, oh, that's the problem, fix it. But you may actually create a different problem because now you haven't got enough money to go and buy the firefighting equipment or something else. So you're always balancing off these very complex equations. And, and, and I don't think there are necessarily just simple, just do this and it'll all go away. These are complex and what I refer to as wicked problems that need quite complicated and multidisciplinary groups and a much more participative, participative sense of community to solve them. Did, and did I you think wanna, that's the challenge. Did you want to add something to that, Kevin? Yeah, look, I think what this is bringing out is, and Drew's just sort of summarised that at the very end there, which is really important, that we're pretty good at putting uh, red, red trucks out on the road and, and uh, doing the, the water and the suppression thing and we, we're good at our planning, we're good at providing information but what we haven't been so good at is really getting that social interaction going and I think a lot of what you're uh, sort of suggesting in a way requires what Drew's just sort of finished up with is basically getting some agreement about how important is this compared with other values and so on. There's a real social issue there and you know I guess coming from Victoria I'd say that you know our fire agencies haven't been fantastic at that. They can put up websites, they'll produce booklets, they'll produce lots of information, but dealing at the social level we're not very good at and, and I guess the bushfire CRC when it got going in 2003, one of the areas that it sort of concentrated on was the social side of it and we're really in, in um, just gone out of pep, prep into grade one in terms of our what we're doing there. It's just so complex for us and we, unless we go down that social line we're never going to solve this problem. It's not a physical uh, issue, it's actually a social problem that we've got. Okay, question downstairs here. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, just to kind of ram home the messages from tonight, what myths you think you've busted here this evening? <laughs> can, can we have that? Yeah, we, should get, we should really ask the answer. audience that. Any <laughs> <laughs> myths have been busted? <laughs> Well, I guess we busted the uh, hiding in the bathroom myth, didn't we? I think a lot of people thought that was a good place to hide, and we've learnt that isn't. Uh, maybe maybe the, the houses don't um, don't automatically become uh, really dangerous places to be at a certain point. They're they're, um, they're 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 a reliable temporary refuge. 
um, and certainly a better option than, than um, most others yeah. in, in, when taken in when you need it when you're taking those last minute decisions. Uh, Drew, any? <coughs> yeah, look, I, I think one of the myths that we've started to deal with and one of the myths that's going to be the really big challenges over the next decade, which is that the emergency services model that has predominated in this area over the last 50 to 100 years, I think needs to be supplemented. And it's one where we move from a position of, I am going to be rescued to one where the community sees themselves as part of the firefighting team. So I don't have to necessarily don all the fancy equipment and go to the sausage sizzle or do all that on a Wednesday night or whatever that happens to be. But, but there will be a sense of that if there's a community partnership around this, we need to work on it together as a group. And we will move to a notion, I would see, where the traditional fire brigades that have been worked with the CMS will become more of community development units and will play a role in building and developing community and educational roles and not just we are the heroes coming to rescue you on the day. I mean there's always going to be a role for that but there's going to be a much broader community development pr process that I think and I think when we get to that we will have busted the biggest myths that we need to bust. Okay upstairs, far away. Um, one of the things mentioned was the lack of information to you know, household owners um, of where the fire is, what it's doing, those sorts of things. Is there almost a need for some sort of real-time bush fire tracking system, maybe a bit like bomb.gov or um, you know, Google Maps style um, system that people can go to? I mean, even if in, during a fire, there's usually still some sort of internet connection via your phone or you can call up someone or something along those lines, some way of being able to track information and, and get more of it to people. Would that help? Yeah, who'd like to tackle that one? I'll, I'll go straight out strong on that and the answer is yes. I mean, I've been busily building a fire behaviour model, if you like, and models are useful in an extent, but good information is always better than any good modelling. And I guess we took 18 months in a Royal Commission to find out we're still finding out what actually happened on Black Saturday. We need to know that within minutes, if you like. You, and it needs to be from all sorts of platforms. Um, some of that technology is already used in some of the uh, in military applications. It's used in sort of terrorist type situations. We, we're really not using it very well. And I've got to say, even the fire agencies, uh, the firefighters, don't really know. They haven't got the information to hand out. It's not that they're withholding it. Um, and so that's an area that we've really got to work on is getting where the triple O calls are coming from, where power lines are going to fault, where the um, uh, talkback radio people are providing messages, you know, use Twitter and all sorts of things. I mean, we're just not harnessing that. It's, it's scary, but the technology's there. We can do that. And is that something you think should be available to the public as well as to the, to the firefighting community? This is a partnership where we're actually trying to solve this problem together, so we've got to share the information. But the job for, if you like, the, the agencies is to, to to filter and validate some of that information rather than just throw out a whole lot of information. One of the, the issues of using some of the, we had Google Maps running, for example, on Black Saturday. Well, you get all sorts of information. Some of it's useful, some of it's uh, not. And as an individual, you can't make that assessment that we need systems in place to actually be able to do some of that filtering. <coughs> that's twice a day. Yeah, that's twice a day as the satellite laps around, so it's not, not quite quick enough. <laughs> Can I make a comment here that I, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion about the use of technology to target information to people. We actually know a lot from research in other areas about this. So for example, if you imagine the scenario where we have some super duper text messaging system that sends you a text and says, Danger Will Robinson or some equivalent to that. <laughs> what would happen in the event that the signal distribution, that is the signal to noise ratio, became too high? That is, too many people were alerted and they go, oh, geez, that's the tenth time I've had that in a while. And the last nine times I got it, it wasn't actually, didn't mean anything, and people have what are called then complacency errors. What about if you don't get a message? Oh, I must be safe. So I, I think we have to be really sophisticated in our understanding is that these are very human systems. And yes, give everybody a text message. Well. Th that might work, but then again it might not. And we do have very clear understandings of how 
over informing and under informing and how people respond to the history of information being provided to them actually distorts their decision making and not necessarily in good ways. <clears throat> and I think that there's a lot more than just um, considering live information feeds about impending events. I think there's a huge amount that technology can offer about mobilising um, information that informs communities to assess their own risks. Um, and it's about, um, you know, imagine if you could click on uh, Google Earth and click on your neighbour's property and see how, how their, how, what bushfire rating your neighbour's property had and how that, that share, you, that you, could, you could imagine how, you could understand whether you think if, if your neighbour's house burnt down, whether yours is going to burn down because they're only this far apart. Um, th th there's sort of knowledge um, and spatial knowledge and mobilising knowledge that where you're giving everything, putting it all in the public domain and mobilising people to make more informed decisions about their own risk. Are you suggesting... And, that, and that's, that's real time and, and static information. You're suggesting that maybe the neighbour's house would burn down in a controlled burn, maybe late at night or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I've forgotten whether we're taking questions from upstairs or downstairs now. Upstairs, maybe. Um, well, I'm wondering if there's any um, scientific evidence that shows us that fire in native vegetation is less dangerous or more dangerous than fire in non-native vegetation? Yeah, interesting question. Any interesting answers? Yeah, the um, yeah, it's all different. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's really good non-native vegetation and there's really bad non-native vegetation, and there's good and bad. Yeah, there's good and bad of both. So, um, so there's no they really clear division. They overlap and mix up quite a bit. So yeah, no, no yeah. clear answer. As a general rule, native vegetation, as is is tends to be more fire adapted than non-native because non-native tends to fall into a category of coming from regions that aren't um, uh, fire prone um, or You're have had to evolve as a, as a fire adapted species. I guess all I, Justin's right on all of that. The, the, the only thing I'd add there for example is if you want to compare a pine plantation to a native forest for example, one of the things that um, is quite distinctive about, say, native eucalypt forest is the amount of uh, firebrand that comes out of the spotting characteristics of it. And that helps the fire in, in, coming out of native forest um, move across quite fragmented or, or discontinuous uh, fuels and, and helps it propagate. Whereas people see fire in a pine plantation, it, it's really quite spectacular. You've got lots of flames, a lot of radiation, but it doesn't spot anywhere near as much. So it's quite bad if you're up close to it, but you don't actually need to move very far away from a pine plantation, for example. So even though it's really fiery and, and burns well, it's uh, the, the distance away you need to be to be in a, 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 an equally safe uh, area is, is uh, much closer. So, but you've got to look at all, you know, you, you, I guess you've got the olives and all the rest of it. It's sort of, uh, it, it depends very much on the species and how they're arranged and, and where they are. Okay, downstairs, do we have another question? Awesome. We've probably got we've probably got time for two two more questions I think one upstairs one downstairs. Uh, my question is about uh, managing when the technology fails. Um, probably what many people forget is that when a fire is coming, you probably don't have any electricity, and therefore a whole lot of your your systems fail. Have you any comment on the sorts of things people should do? to anticipate managing without the resources they might otherwise think would work. Okay, how do you get by without the electricity in a fire? Yeah, I, in sort of talking to people post fire, it's, it's, um, it, it's worrying that something like the, the power turning off or the, um, or the water pressure dwindling to nothing is um, uh, one of the triggers for uh, panic. Um, and it's unfortunate. That, um, that that is a trigger for panic because it's one of the um, clear basic doctrines um, that, that people should understand about fire and fire events is um, you, you're most likely to lose those um, while the fire's approaching and, um, and you, you must have all the relevant 
means and understanding to be uh, capable without those in place. So um, it, I think it comes back to, um, you know, the, the knowledge that sits in the person's head is probably their pow most powerful tool that they have in those circumstances and um, understanding fire behaviour and what fire events are all about um, is um, are, are the real essential pieces of the puzzle to help them act rationally and, um, and effectively in um, taking the most appropriate course of actions that minimise their uh, life risk. Okay, time for one last question upstairs. Uh, thank you very much. We've seen on the video uh, quite a lot of different uh, firefighting suits being applied from the good CFS kind of gear to the thongs and stubbies. Uh, Do you want to know which is best? No, no. <laughs> I've got that sorted, I think. One of the, yeah, one of the myths that I think uh, I've heard around the place is that uh, if you are in a situation in not very much protective gear is to actually douse yourself in water and then uh, go on fighting the fire. What's the, uh, what's the science in that? And do you finish up with a lot of scolds and uh, get treated for that sort of trouble worse than the fire? Okay, sounds like a good myth to bust or not to so, bust. So, so maybe clarify, you're talking about wet, wet clothes or um, yeah, bare skin, skin with wet with water? Yeah, clothes with wet, wet clothes on them. Explain. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, we want nude firefighters and clothes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nude wet ones. That's right. Well, uh, uh, bare, bare skin, wet or dry, um, not much difference. So you're pretty much stuck. Um, <laughs> wet, wet clothes versus dry clothes um, depends on the circumstance. Um, And, and the actual type of clothing, so it's it's not a it's not a clear answer at all. Um, the the water is useful. Um, it's it gives you a latent heat of vaporisation and it cools. And there's lots of wind, so you're being cooled at the same time as the radiant heat is heating you up. Um, uh, so no, there's no there's no real clear answer, and and uh, you're not putting yourself in an extremely dangerous situation by getting wet accidentally or on purpose so don't be alarmed if you do if you are wet um, yeah. okay well look uh, that's that's it for now uh, could you please thank these three guys done a wonderful job I thought.